We've been in a series on Genesis, and this is our sixth week, and we are in chapter four. <laughs> so as you can see, it takes a little time to get through because the stories are so incredibly rich and filled with so much information. And uh, so today we're in Genesis chapter four, and we're going to talk about really one of the most devastating stories in history, and that is the first murder. And it wasn't just of a stranger, of an enemy was of a brother. And so we're in Genesis chapter four, beginning in verse one. It said, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. He wasn't just angry, he was very angry. And his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence. It's a really sad statement, isn't it? Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Uh, back in chapter 3, we talked about the very first sin that was committed by a human, and it didn't take long to get to the sin of murder. Um, I wish I could tell you that one sin is all we ever do in life. And for sure, one sin can certainly wreck a life. But the truth is, is that it's usually followed and sometimes made even worse. The human family was growing. Adam and Eve had children, Cain and Abel. And um, the two boys grow up. One of us interested in tilling the ground, a farmer, and the other is interested in tending herds, a shepherd. And so what's interesting is that God actually doesn't show favoritism to one or the other based on their occupation. How many are glad God accepts you regardless of the work that you do? Yeah, he, we play favorites, but he, he doesn't. The really interesting point of this story starts out with this, everyone sacrifices. Everyone sacrifices, uh, both sons, Cain and Abel, bring an offering to the Lord. Now, there are some people who really consider this kind of superstitious and archaic. What a silly and, and stupid thing to do. Why would people bring uh, offerings and sacrifices to God? And, and before you go down that road too far, let me just suggest to you that we all make sacrifices in some way. You are a person who makes sacrifices. Everyone sacrifices either for their future or they sacrifice their future. If you work hard, if you study hard, if you spend wisely, if you invest wisely, what are you doing? You're sacrificing for your future. 
If you do as little as possible, if you blow off your classes and you put minimal work in and you spend all that you have, what are you doing? You're sacrificing your future, not just for it. Both Cain and Abel come and they present offerings to God. What's interesting is uh, they didn't assume this was just the job of a parent or just the job of the oldest son. They understood that they were to bring their offerings to God. They've been taught the value of worship. And so Cain brings fruit from the soil. We don't know exactly what it was. Uh, could have been vegetables, could have been fruit. Uh, Abel brings fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. And the Bible tells us that God actually preferred Abel's offering. Does this mean that God prefers carnivores to vegetarians? I don't think that's what it's saying. Um, and there are some people who think that the reason that God didn't accept Ab or Cain's offering is because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. And uh, there's a couple challenges with that, uh, not the least of which is written into the law of God, there was the right for people to bring offerings that were not blood sacrifice, and God accepted them. So that doesn't seem to be the primary reason. So what is going on here? And, and this is what's interesting. The, the, there's a clue in the story as to what might be happening. And, and the clue comes from two words. The one word is some, and the other is, is firstborn. Some versus firstborn. So Cain brings some of the fruit of the ground. Abel brings fat. Uh, in the ancient world, fat was considered really, really good. I know, you're stunned. You would never think that, right? We, we prefer all of our meat to be very lean, except we don't really. And, uh, and so uh, fat, and then from the firstborn, what this is indicating is that Abel is actually giving his very best. The firstborn of the flock would have high value, and fat content would have high value. And so he's bringing the very best, but all it says about Cain's offering is that he's just bringing some of the fruit of the ground. If Cain is not bringing the best that he has, the question is, why? Who is he reserving the best for? For himself, for his family, for someone else? It's hard to know. I think this is a good thing for us to focus on because it helps us understand how we think about God. Do we only see God as the source of comfort when we're going through a difficult time, or do we see God as the source of everything in our life? And if you just see God as a source of comfort, you are going to really struggle with giving the best to God. Sacrifices actually help us learn from the past and sacrifices help us invest in the future. This is a really interesting concept. In the ancient world, sacrifices embrace a concept of past and future and connecting it to the present, which is, this is what humans understand, right? We say, well, the past is behind me and it has no effect on me. I wouldn't have to talk to more than two of your friends and family members to know that's not true. Here's what's true about the past. The past is never the past. It's right here and it's right now. And if we don't learn to deal with what happened in the past, it'll just keep repeating itself or escalating in our lives. The past is not the past. And in, in bringing an offering regarding the past, what a person is doing, it's not trying to bribe God. What they're doing is they're taking responsibility for what happened in their life. They're not trying to get something from God. They're just saying, I understand that that was a thing, and I'm willing to pay a price associated with that so that I've learned my lesson. It's an important concept. Sacrifices were also made to invest in the future. Why bother? Because humans have a tendency to believe that the future can be better than the present. We really struggle with emotional health when we stop believing that. We will, we will become very discouraged and possibly even depressed. Once again, a sacrifice for the future is not a bribe for God to set things up for us. It's just suggesting that investing is, is something, this is investing in something that we believe in. 
we're willing to put something towards. And in our world, we offer sacrifices all the time. Any parents in the room? Yeah, you know all about sacrifice for your kids, right? They come into your house as little infants, and they can't do anything for themselves. They can't mow the lawn. They can't vacuum the rug. They can't sweep the floor. They can't shovel the driveway. And what do we do? We take care of them, and we feed them, and we clothe them, and, we take, and, we, and if they're hurt, we, we try to get them back to health. We do everything we possibly can. And do and you know how they repay us? With resentment, mostly. <laughs> they're frustrated, right? And so what do parents do? They just sacrifice. That, that's, that's what we do. Why? There's only one reason. You love them. Even when you're not happy with how they're acting or, or even when you're frustrated by what they have or have not done, you still love them. And so you, you invest in that. By the way, we, we love our friends and we love our family. We also offer sacrifices to people that we have some kind of respect for. In our culture, that would be like a celebrity. Okay? I don't know who your favorite vocal artist is or, or who your favorite performer is or who your favorite sports personality is, but I know that you are willing to put out some money to go see that person live. If I want to go to a Bills game, it costs money. If I want to go listen to an artist perform, it costs money. And I won't be the only one there. Now, I could, I could say, oh, I'm going, to do, I'm going to rent a big theater, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to sing, and let's see who will sacrifice to come hear me. Not one person in this room, even. <laughs> Not one. Celebrities, talent, creativity. We sacrifice for who we love. We sacrifice for who we respect. My question is, is what do you sacrifice for God? Now, uh, some of the sacrifices are better than others. This is very disappointing to us. <laughs> this is the part of the story. We don't like any better than Cain did. As it turns out, God favors some sacrifices over others. And the question is, why would he do that? And some people think it's just an act of, of uh, in the moment, like a capricious God saying, oh, today I like that one better. Uh, that's not what it is. If we're bringing something other than our best, God's not impressed with that. There was a, a farmer one time who uh, had a cow that gave birth to two calves, twins, and this was not expected. And so he went and he told his wife and he told the pastor of his church, he said, my, my cow has given birth to two calves. I will give one to the Lord and I will keep one for myself. That sounds like a very generous thing to do. And then in about a week, one of the calves died. It got sick and it died. And so he went to the preacher and he said, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but the Lord's calf died. <laughs> In the Old Testament, the people would find the, the straggliest, hair falling out, leaning up against a fence post sheep and drag that into God and say, here's your sacrifice. And in the book of Malachi, it talks about this. And, and God says, why don't you try offering that to someone you actually care about and see what they think of it? Our challenge is that we think God is unfair and unreasonable to show favor with a sacrifice. This story is important because what it teaches us is when we approach God, it's on his terms, not on ours. I know our culture tells us that we can worship anything, anyone, in any way. And you can. Those rights have been provided you by the Constitution and bylaws of the United States government. But if you want to approach God, you're not going to approach him based on the Constitution and bylaws of a country. You're going to approach him based on his word. And so we bring our offering to him. Somebody says, well, 
I don't think my offering is good enough. Now, this is where we really need to be careful because what's true is, is that we can get to a place where we think that we're not giving enough. And so, so the number, the, the top number is, is, is what God is looking for. And, and I, somebody will give more than anyone else this week at Calvary Assembly. I don't know who it will be. Does that mean that everybody else's offering doesn't count because it didn't give that much? And that's not the issue. Jesus actually sat in a temple and he watched people giving offerings and there was a little woman a widow who had nothing left in life just two coins and she turned them into the offering and Jesus did not say there's no favor on that offering how small is that where is your faith what he said was is that that's the greatest gift that's been given here today we tend to put value on how much something is. Jesus puts value on how much that thing is to us. What does that represent to us? And he, he celebrated that. There's a part of us that wants God to be happy with whatever we give. You should just be happy I gave you anything. And there's a there's a reason people get frustrated with God when they feel like their gift hasn't been accepted. By the way, this is one of the primary reasons people struggle with Jesus. Because we can bring all the gifts of our good deeds and our own moral accomplishments and all the generous things that we have done, and we can assume that we have earned our own salvation. Nothing makes people matter than to tell them, I'm sorry, all of your good deeds and all your generosity are not enough. There's only one offering that's enough, and that's the offering of Jesus. If we can earn our salvation, we just feel better than other people. Now, I don't know how Cain and Abel were able to discern which offering God favored. Some people think that God brought fire down out of heaven. Some people believe that God said something. Uh, we actually don't know, but I do know this. We don't like it when our sacrifices are deemed not to be enough. And in this moment, Cain had an option, and his option was to be humble. This was an opportunity to learn something, that, that someone did something better than he did, and rather being annoyed at them, he could learn from them. Is this getting real to you yet? Because this is what happens to us. When someone does something better, our tendency is to just be annoyed with them rather than taking a humble approach and saying, what can I learn from this? Humility is willing to learn. Pride doesn't want to learn. Pride just wants to be right. And if there's one thing our culture is known for, we want to be right. We're pretty sure we are. We don't have much respect for people who think differently than we do. So what will you do when your sacrifice is not good enough? Well, you can become very angry. Cain was angry. And God asked him, he said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And this reveals something important that's going on in the heart of Cain. He thought God should accept whatever he offered. He thought God was being unfair. You can become humble. You can learn from something or you can respond in pride. What's interesting is that God didn't cut Cain off because he brought a lesser offering. God still initiated the conversation. God went to Cain. He opened up the conversation and he told him, he says, there's an opportunity for you to turn this situation around right now. Uh, there's, this, uh, there's a very small, it's one of the smallest books in the New Testament. It's called the book of Jude. And it's only got one chapter in it. And in verse 10 and 11, it says, these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct as irrational animals do will destroy them. There's a lot they don't understand, and what they do understand is just their own internal guidance mechanisms and their instincts. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. The results of going the way of Cain creates options that give license to the darkest parts of our heart. The sin that seems so small is going to ruin it all. God warned Cain that sin was crouching at the door. Have you ever seen anybody try to startle somebody else? Well, let's just check. How many here have been startled by somebody? Yeah. 
How many here have startled somebody? Yes, almost the same number of hands, and I'm not surprised. And when you're going to, when you want to startle somebody, what do you do? You kind of get down, you crouch, you make yourself small, less visible, not as obvious, so that you have the element of surprise with them. And what he says is, sin is crouching at your door. It's making itself as small as it possibly can. It doesn't want to be observed and it doesn't want to be seen as much of a threat. Sin hides and it presents something, it presents itself as something insignificant. And this is, this is fascinating. I don't even know what to make of this. It, it says, and it wants to have you. You know how we think about sin? The primary challenge of sin is that we want to have it. And God here reveals there's something about sin that also wants to have us. And sin doesn't just hurt people, it hurts God. Our sins are not so much about breaking the rules of God as they are about breaking the heart of God. And some people are oblivious to this, they don't pay any attention to it, but some people actually attend it, intend it. When they, when they commit a sin, they intend not just to hurt others, they intend to hurt God. It's exactly what people did with Jesus. The favor of God was on him. And that frustrated a lot of people. And they made a decision. That wasn't going to stand. He should die. What did he do? He spoke truth. He brought healing to those who were sick, freedom to those who were oppressed, food to those who were hungry, gave wisdom to those who would not have access to such wisdom. He made people feel welcome and accepted and loved and cared for. And he made them realize that God was far closer to them than they ever hoped or dreamed it would be. And all of these things he was able to do. Well, obviously the favor of God was on him. So what's left? And that is to kill him. Now, you may be sitting here right now and going, Whew, man, those canes. Our world would be better off without them. Let me tell you something. The world is not divided between canes and Abel's. We are divided. Part of us is Cain and part of us is Abel. Do, do you remember the, there used to be a, uh, a store that you could go buy things for home projects. It's called Grossman's. Does anybody remember that? There's a little Grossman in everyone. There's a little Grossman in you. That was their commercial. And I was just so why, why would people want to go to a place where you're called a gross man? And it turns out people didn't. And that's why <laughs> that business is gone. There's Cain in you. Oh, not me, Pastor. Wait, 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 before you go too far in self-defense. Let me ask you what happens when somebody you know in life actually does better than you or looks better than you or has more than you. Where do your thoughts drift? They get better opportunities. They have more. They get chosen. And we say things like, it's just because of who they know. They're playing a game they shouldn't be playing. They're cutting quarters. They know all the right people. They're cheating the system. What are we doing? We're acting just like Cain. I have nothing to learn from that person. And there we are. And we may be tempted to, we may not be tempted to sneak up on them in a field to end their life, but there are other ways to reduce them. And, and eliminate them from our lives. And the worst part is when we do it, we feel very right. Very right. There are sins that we know are, are wrong and we regret doing them. And they can do a lot of damage, but I think the sins that do the most damage in our world are the ones where we feel we are right. We have a right to do that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. We can do a lot of damage with sins that we're sure we're right of. It's the sins of self-righteousness. They're like, like dirty bombs. Mixed pride and anger. You've created an incendiary device. 
God says, where's your brother? Why should I know, says Cain. We can tell ourselves we really didn't distance ourselves or, or do anything to harm someone else. We can tell ourselves that whatever our level of secret encounters in the field were, didn't do that much damage to them and didn't affect us. But this is what we don't understand. It's not just the evils of the world that suffer, it's what happens to us when we act like King. Something gets hollowed out. Something gets fragile or hard. And our lives become something far different than what God intended or what we even want. We have to stop talking down to others or thinking less of others who are doing better than we are. And this is why. Because if all you can do is find fault with someone who is doing better, why would you want to get better? And what do you think is going to happen to you when you are doing better? This is no way to live. God gave his best, even when we don't give our best. Cain didn't see the benefit of what God was giving him in that moment. Cain imagined that only fools give their best to God. And I mean, God could have taken the life of Cain, a life for a life. He doesn't do it. And there are some people who think he went far too light on him. Cain's actually crying out. It's, it's too much of a punishment to wander the earth. God actually puts a mark on him to protect him from being killed. I said, well, doesn't God care about Abel? Yes, he does. But he also cares about the Cains of our world. He cares about the Cain in you. And the grace of God can be seen even in the very first murder. I, I listen to people all the time who talk about how harsh and judgmental God is. Just for the record, I think our world is way harsher and far more judgmental than God. And I don't have to spend two minutes on social media to prove my point. So, God's grace is available to you right now. Let's bow our heads. Is there a way in which you have looked down on or separated yourself from someone just because they had more or did better or had better options and opportunities? Have you found yourself wanting to bring them down a notch? What I can tell you is it's no way to live. You will become a restless wanderer in this world. And it's not what God has for you. So Father, today I ask that you would help us. That in those moments when we see your blessings on another's life or your favor on another's life, rather than accusing you of not being fair, help us ask ourselves, what can we learn? How can we humble ourselves? We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's all stand together.